I think what we would do is, uh, as agreed, we will uh, request Dr. Chabra to welcome and uh, start the sessions. And then, yeah, Raga, we are uh, live. I we are live, sir. We are live, sir. We are live, yeah. May I request uh, Dr. Chabra to start the session. So, good afternoon, uh, everyone here in India, and uh, good morning to friends in Germany. Uh, I think uh, today is a historic day. We start. Uh, we initiate the collaboration with DWG officially today with this joint session, even though individually a lot of us have been collaborating together with each other. Uh, I will, I just have a brief presentation to make. So meanwhile, uh, uh, welcoming all uh, our friends from Germany and uh, of course our colleagues here who are in India as well. So I'll be talking on opportunities and challenges uh, for ASSI and DWG collaboration. Um, for our friends uh, from Germany, a brief history about the Association of Spine Surgeons of India. It was 18 December 1985 when Dr. V.T. Ingal Halikar spearheaded the need for Association of Spine Surgeons of India. The first scientific meeting of ASSI was held from 1st to 3rd May 1986, Mumbai, as ASICON 1. Uh, the main objectives of ASSI uh, are listed below. And in fact, we will use this to discuss on how we could collaborate further. Of course, uh, the German Spine Society needs no introduction, uh, along with its president's we have uh, its officials here, so welcome uh, to all of them, uh, and uh, we look forward to a long-term collaboration. Its activities, as we could see, are focused on exchange of knowledge, connect and collaborate with other countries to come together and work ag against the spine-related ailments and adopt the cutting-edge technology. So the second activity is the one they are pursuing here. Let's discuss what is the need for ASSI and DWG collaboration. In fact, I would ask, do Indo-German relations need any introduction? There are 98 German colleges in India. There are a lot of collaborative efforts going on. There's an Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have an Indo-German Young Leaders for Forum. We have an Indo-German uh, Training Center and an Indo-German school and our leaders frequently meet each other and collaborate with each other. And that happens not only within the leaders, but also amongst the citizens as well. We have an Indo-German orthopedic foundation and the Indo-German cooperation in health research uh, uh, is going well with the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, and the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, Federal Republic of Germany, agreeing for cooperative programs in biotechnology. Similarly, we have an Indo-German Endo and Laparoscopic Society, which is there. Uh, we have been working with our friends in Germany individually whether it's Patrick who first introduced me to all of uh, my friends in Germany, to the stalwarts, others, other stalwarts in Germany, uh, we have been working, but this is the first time that our societies could come together. So India is one of Germany's closest partners when it comes to jointly funding major research facilities. Both countries are committed to holistic research for greater impacts and applied solutions. And when scientific minds come together, there's always a scope for research. Collaboration always helps in the sharing of knowledge. Together we think more than individual. So since we think alike, let's work together. And that's a normal uh, uh, going. So this could be, we could discuss our uh, various collaborative efforts under the various aims and objectives of ASSI. I'm sure they are the same for DWG. When it comes to scientific activities, we could have combined sessions and conferences like these ones. We could, in fact, also have joint conferences if uh, we evolve to that stage. 
uh, we have an Indian Spine Journal, and uh, we could seek contributions from top scholars uh, within your society. We could expand the reviewer database to DWG. We could ha ha have seek your help in ASSI Connect app, which, which we are using for case-based discussions and webinars for fellows, uh, cross-country fellow webinars and case presentations could take place. So when it comes to education, training and capacity building, ASSI plays a multitude role in enhancing knowledge and education of budding spine surgeons. So we have a two-year comprehensive spine fellowship program. We have ASSI short-term fellowship program. And in fact, many of my fellows here pre periodically go to colleagues in Germany, whether it's Patrick or Franke or anybody, and we could develop that officially between the two societies an exchange program within the fellowship course that we all run. We also have an online master series webinars which take place and pro series webinars which take place for the general orthopedic surgeon. And we could collaborate to have joint webinars in this regard. When it comes to networking and collaboration, uh, uh, networking amongst executive committees and members could take place such that the official handshake which takes place at the top reaches uh, people also the normal members as well and we could come out with joint newsletters when it comes to research we could we assi has a multi-centric research project we have around six multi-centric research projects going each year and we could also collaborate such that we could expand the multi-centric research projects across the continents between our two countries. We could look at various, uh, uh, various other advanced technologies like epidural stimulation, brain machine interface, biomechanics laboratory and skill development centers. And we could also collaborate in the field of basic sciences and ep epidemiological uh, uh, research. In fact, uh, we have various research awards and we could even think of joint research awards which would make it more prestigious. When it comes to partnering and collaboration, we are doing just that right now. There's a need to strengthen and consolidate it further. And of course, in the field of advocacy, uh, we observe SCI Day along with also our colleague, our uh, uh, sister organizations in Germany, but uh, we could strengthen that between our societies. We re yesterday launched the Injury Prevention Community Awareness Program. I'm sure we can work together in this regard and we can try to lobby to reduce unethical practices like experimental stem cell therapies being offered at a price to people uh, and trying to adopt it into clinical practice. So what we will achieve with this collaboration, growth and enhancement of knowledge amongst the surgeons, increased opportunities of research, develop innovative ideas, teamwork amongst young surgeons, technology exchange, and uh, things like virtual reality could be used. How we could do it as some of the salient features that we discussed would be combined annual meetings, virtual meetings, CMEs, fellowship exchange programs, multicentric trials and exchange of knowledge programs at professor level. A small step in the right direction is often what is needed to embark on a fulfilling journey. We need to stay in closer touch and brainstorm, use it as an opportunity to learn to build a more positive and inclusive future. Many single drops make a C. Let's come together and begin the journey to fight the spinal ailments because we have got each other's back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Chabra, and uh, that was very nice. Uh, you have actually included every spectra that we can cooperate with the, the German societies. Now, may I request Frank? Frank uh, Kanziora, I think I got the, sec the surname correct on what they think about the projects of the German Spine Society and uh, their collaboration with the Association of Spine Surgeons of India and how 
they can take it forward. Over to Frank. So first of all, let me say thank you very much. It's a great honor and a pleasure for the German Spine Society to be here. Um, on behalf of the German Spine Society, I would like to say thank you very much for inviting us to your prestigious meeting. Um, it is very important for us, uh, which you can see due to the fact that the whole presidential line of the German Spine Society is part of this day today. Uh, uh, Ulf Lillingquist as the current president, uh, Peter Baikocci as the vice president, and finally Markus Arendt as the president-elect, they are all here together with you and we would like to uh, elaborate what type of cooperation we can have in the future. So thank you very much for having us today. ...of that prestigious conference. I'm the past president of the German Spine Society, the Deutsche Wirbelsäulengesellschaft. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today and to talk about a future cooperation. I think it's absolutely mandatory before we talk about co cooperation, we need to talk about who we are. And so I would like to present you some news about the German Spine Society. In fact, the German Spine Society is a very young society. It was founded in 2005 but it has two very prestigious predecessor organizations. One is the German Society for Spinal Research, which was founded in 1958. And the other one is the German Society for Spinal Surgery, which was founded in 1987. And both of these society merged in 2005 and founded the German Spine Society. The German Spine Society has currently 2,300 members from co coming from 26 different countries. Most of them are, of course, from the German-speaking ones. We are balanced societies between orthopedic surgeons on the one side and neurosurgeons on the other side, and we are predominantly a male society. The structure of the German Spine Society is, first of all, it is a scientific organization with the goal to improve the quality of spine care. But we have other organizations which are associated with the German Spine Society. That is the German Spine Foundation, which is a charity organization which supports science, spinal science. We have a business unit, which is the Academy of the German Spine Society. And we have a political arm, which is the Professional Spine Association, which we run together with our orthopedic and neuro colleagues. The main activities of the German Spine Society include the German Spine Congress, which is an annual congress where typically more than 4,000 participants are on the spot. We also run a program for spinal education events. We had 33 of these spinal education events in 2019. We are offering a publication, which is the verbal Soile, with four issues a year. And we're doing something for our patients. We provide a second opinion portal and patient information material. Our major project at the moment is to develop a state certified spine surgeon curriculum together with our orthopedic and neurosurgical friends. In fact, as already mentioned, the main goal of the society is quality assurance to improve spine care. And we are running a, a program with three different topics. First, an individual certification program, an institutional certification program, and finally, a benchmarking via the German Spine Registry. And I would like to talk a little bit more in detail about these three different projects. First of all, the individual quality assurance, which is a certification project which was started in 2011 with a surgical arm and which was added to a non-surgical arm in 2018. So far, more than 1,800 surgeons have been certified with that individual quality assurance certificate, where you can have either a basic master or excellence certificate. For the basic certificate, you have to be part of some basic surgical courses for including the degenerative diseases, deformity fractures, but also intradural pathologies. For a master certificate, you need to have advanced courses which deal with advanced surgical techniques and also with revision and complication management. And for the conservative uh, non-surgical courses, you need to know a lot of things about manual medicine, physiotherapy, pain treatment, or injection therapy. 
So all the different courses which we are running are, have a standardized structure. So we have typical two-day courses as depicted here on the right side. They have a standardized content with a defined curriculum and with master slides for each and every talk. Where our theoretical and practical parts included, we offer cadaver labs during the courses and we perform a continuous evaluation of the courses to improve them over time. And we also started with having e-learning modules. So if you want to get a certificate by the German Spine Society, a basic certificate, you have to be a board certified trauma or orthopedic or neurosurgeon, and you need successfully pass the six basic courses which we are offering. If you want to have a master certificate, you need to have the basic certificate, of course, and you also have to pass the two advanced courses. Further, you have to be a minimum of three years in practice and you have to do a certified number of spinal surgeries. Finally, if you want to get an excellent certificate, you need to be five years in a leading position of a spine department. Of course, you have to have the basic and the master certificate and you have to have an adequate scientific output and you have to be voted for that excellent certificate anonymously by the 12 members of the commission. The second type of our quality insurance program is an institutional quality assurance programs we put in place 2015. So far already 82 centers in Germany have been certified by a free level certification system which is a level three, a spinal institution, a level two, a special spine center, or a level one, a spine center of maximum care. To become such a certified spine center, you have to apply for it and you have to take care about your de de of our different pathologies, degenerative disease, tumor, inflammatory injuries, or deformities. Depending on the applied certificate level which you want to get, you have to meet the requirements of either one, two, or four of these pathology groups. And you have to fulfill a certain amount of characteristics with regards to equipment, diagnostic, therapeutic, or your interdisciplinary facilities. Overall, there are 142 items which you might fulfill which includes quality management, a certain amount of staff members, on-call duty for spinal pathologies or outpatient clinics, but also a certain frequency of surgery per year. For example, if you want to be certified for a degenerative pathology as a spine institution, you need to perform a minimum of 100 surgeries. If you want to become a special spine center, you need to have 200. And if you want to have a spine center of maximum care certificate, you need to perform even 400 spinal surgeries. So how does it work? In fact, you have to apply for such a certificate and you apply not to the German Spine Society. You apply to a controlled certification company, which is accredited by the state and health ministry in Germany. And then you have to fill up your form when you will have an audit. And if the audit is good, when you will get your certification, and the only thing the DWG does is it will double check the uh, recommendation out of the, of the certification company, and then you get your certificate, which is typically valid for four years. So why should you be certified? Of course, the certification sets your institution apart as a recognized spine center, not only between, in the eyes of the patient, but also in, in the eyes of your colleague, the employers, and the insurances. It ensures a certain standard for uh, due to the external independent quality control, but it also gives you the opportunity to establish your own internal quality to control to optimize your structure of your spine center. Finally, the third level on the third part of the program is the benchmarking due to the DWG registry. It was established in 2013 based on the spine tango of Eurospine. It currently includes more than 180,000 data sets and 106 centers in the German speaking countries are contributing. It is not only a benchmarking tool, it is also a scientific tool because it gives you the option to document all the pathology surgeries, regardless if it's conservatively and also the implants on the one side, 
but it also it allows you the evaluation of your patient with follow-up examinations like the COMI, the ODI, the EQ5D, or the SRS22. As you can see, the number in the DWG registry is continuously growing over time. And what it gives you is depicted here on the right side. It shows your own cases in relation to the overall benchmarking in the registry. So in summary, the German Spine Society has, as you have seen, developed a lot of activities. Quality insurance this is one of the major focus of the German Spine Society, and we are really willing and able to cooperate with the, Asian, uh, with the Association for Spinal Surgeons in India in many, many ways, and it would be our pleasure to work together in the future. So thank you very much for having us today. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, system that you have developed in Germany, and uh, we hope we will also emulate and uh, get on to similar standards so that our quality of care to our patients will be on par with the best in the world in uh, the vast country like India. And we're also working on, uh, as President Chabra has said, uh, we were working on uh, getting centers developed into uh, a proper spine uh, education centers and uh, incubating uh, centers where the surgeons from across India go there and train and teach the local surgeons. That is what uh, we are doing and hopefully we'll plan to do a, a bit more. Can you tell us just one or two areas where we can think of cooperating between India and Germany at the moment? I think there are a lot of things which you can uh, profit from each other. I think it is absolutely mandatory to work together to uh, improve our educational events, for example. You know, for example, something like uh, Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is extremely there and nobody in Germany has an idea about that. You're familiar with that. So you can teach us, we can teach you. I think that would be a great opportunity to work together. It's also, if you look at the scientific component, which was already mentioned, I think if we, if we combine our knowledge and our research options, I think that would be very beneficial for both societies. Lovely. We'll certainly take it forward from there. Uh, may I request now Dr. Rajeshekaran to speak on subclinical infection, a cause for lumbar disc degeneration. Good evening. <clears throat> I would like to start off by thanking ASSI for this opportunity and also wishing our friends from Germany and also all the participating societies a very happy, healthy and safe 2021. Now the topic of my talk is on the role of subclinical infection in disc degenerative disease. Now we all know that disc degeneration is inevitable, but the etiopathogenesis is still a controversy. And the big question mark is on the role of subclinical infection. Now it all started with this paper in 20, 2001, where Alistair actually demonstrated the presence of bacteria in disc samples from herniation. And this factor got augmented by the paper from Albert, where he showed good results following antibiotic therapy in a certain group of low back pain patients. But this idea is still a raging controversy. And most of the non-believers actually strongly believe that the bacteria that is demonstrated in these studies is actually a contamination. But however, there is a strong proof that bacteria can be an initiator and propagator of many diseases. Like for example, we know H. pylori is a cause for peptic disease. We know that there is a strong association between P. acnes and adhesive capsulitis. And in rheumatoid arthritis, there is a whole amount of organisms which have been proven to initiate and propagate the inflammation. And in many cases of aseptic loosening, which were previously thought to be cement related, are now known to be infection. In 2017, we also presented this paper on the Isels Prize winning paper on the role of possibility of subclinical infection being a cause for disc disease. We not only demonstrated bacterial proteins in normal discs, 
but to a high level in discs with disc herniations and disc degeneration. But there is still a lot of controversy. And this controversy is between infection and contamination. Now, if we have to settle this, there are many missing links that have to be addressed. And I would like to present our work on this subject. First of all, we need to document the presence of bacteria in the discs. We need to decide whether it is contamination or actually infection by showing viability of these bacteria and that there is an infective process going on. And this is the cause for this disease. So it all starts with the primary question. Does normal disc have bacteria? Now, most of us strongly believe that the discs are highly sterile in health because they are the largest avascular structures in our body. But our understanding of infection etiology has always depended on our ability to identify organisms. So far as we restrict to culture sensitive methodology, we will miss identifying a whole lot of microorganisms which cannot be cultured easily. easily. And so metagenomics is, and next genome sequencing is the future. And this allows us to identify all the bacteria by DNA sequencing. And this is what we employed. And we looked at eight MRI normal control discs, eight degenerated discs, and eight herniated discs, which were all harvested under sterile precautions and immediately snap frozen. What we found was that there was a rich bacterial presence in all three groups. And even in the normal discs, we showed that even in the health, normal lumbar disc has a good presence of uh, bacteria. But the microbiome of normal disc differed from that of the degenerated and herniated disc, both in biodiversity and abundance. While normal disc had a wide spectrum of bacteria and relatively very low abundance of established pathogens, degenerate disc had a reduction in the spectrum but they had a relative increase in the number of pathogens. Beneficial bacteria like Bacillus coagulans and Bacillus clausii, they were all present only in organ donor discs. And Lactobacillus mucosae and Sphingomonas were present in abundance only in the organ donor discs. Whereas bacteria with pathogenic potential like Pseudomonas fragile, Privetola, and Streptococcus and Privatola palins were all present only in the degenerated and herniated disc. And this is what we reported last year in the European Spine Journal, that human intervertebral discs harbor a unique microbiome and dysbiosis determines health and disease. Now, what is meant by dysbiosis? Dysbiosis is the balance in the normal between the type and quantity of bacteria which is present in a tissue. And an alteration of the normal ratio can actually determine and cause a disease. So we have symbio symbiotic bacteria, common salts and pathogens. And when they are in balance, it is the state of health. And an imbalance between the type of organism present can actually cause a dysbiosis, which can result in a problem. Now, in the last 2019 NAS Outstanding Paper Award, we established that there is an inflammaging, a constant low level of inflammation occurring in disease discs. And we also showed that this could be because of a bacterial induced inflammation. Now, if you looked at normal discs in healthy young discs, most of the proteins that were present were structural proteins and metabolic proteins, and there was no complement cascade proteins or degradative proteins. Absence of inflammatory markers and degeneration was in the young and normal disc. Contrast to this, in degenerated discs, we found an upregulation of complements and degradation proteins and inadequate complement inhibitors, which actually showed that this inflammation which is present in the degeneration and herniation could be as a result of bacteria. 
in the third part of our study, there was further proof because there was the, we established the presence of host defense response proteins. Now we know that whenever there is a pathogen exposed to the tissue, the human body mounts up a defense. And the proof of this can be found from the presence of human defense response uh, proteins. Now you could see here, we were able to establish a whole number of uh, host defense response proteins. For example, we found that prolactin induced protein, it was nine times higher than what was present in the normal disc. And we also know that these act as the first line of defense against invading pathogens. Similarly, complement component and heat pillar. There was a 3.6 fold variation. And we know that these are all a part of membrane attack complex on bacterial cell membranes in which beta subunit helps in complement mediated bacterial clean. Proof of all presence of these bacteria actually stand as a proof for uh, infective pathway and uh, activity going on. For example, defensin was also uniquely present only in disc degeneration and in herniation. And defensin is a family of antimicrobial and cytotoxic peptides found in the microbicidal granules of neutrophils that helps in phagocyte mediated host defense. And the presence of this and another 42 host defense response proteins in diseased discs actually showed proof of uh, inflammation and an inflammation that is initiated and progressive because probably of bacteria and infection. So we came up with a unified uh, pathway. Most of us used to think that the traditional hypothesis that degeneration is mechanically induced, but we do think that this is an important factor. And this can actually be the initiator of a cascade of events. Mechanical disruption can either lead to end plate breaks or annular tears, both of which lead to neovascularization of the disc. There is ample proof for this in literature. Neovascularization then carries the bacterial, and this can lead to bacterial inoculation, and that can lead to a low-grade infection. And this low-grade infection can lead to a constant source of inflammation, and this inflammatory cascade and perpetuation of inflammation can lead to disc degeneration and herniation. Now, there can be a genetic susceptibility for this. And that is the way that genetics also will play an important part in disc degeneration. So our study over a period of time has shown proof that bacteria is present in even health and they are present in a difference of ratio with dysbiosis in the degenerated disc. It is not a contamination because we have proved that the virulence that they are multiplying, they are viable and actually they are a cause for infection because we have also proved that there is dysbiosis and there is inflammation and the presence of a host defense response proteins, which actually shows an infective process. We know that human cells versus bacteria in the body, we are outnumbered by the bacteria by a ratio of 10 is to one. Many of the bacteria which we thought were common cells, now we know that they can be a source of many kinds of disease. Now, it was Chanakya who actually said, to underestimate the enemy and to mistake an enemy as a friend are the two mistakes that any king must avoid. So I think in the recent few years, we have now come to the state mainly also because of the fact and the ability of us to identify all the bacteria that are present in the tissues by next genome sequencing, that many of these bacteria are the source of a constant inflammation in the tissues. And this is also probably the cause, or, or at least one of the causes for disc degeneration. Now, this is, will be very important because of the role of bacteria as it is being established in health and disease. 
And if we can prove that there is a role for infection in disc degeneration, it will dramatically change the way we look at this pathology. And it will also offer and open up new possibilities for treatment of these. As Louis Pasteur said, we are all on the verge of mysteries and the veil is getting thinner and thinner and hope that the truth of what is the real pathology before, behind disc degeneration will be in our hand very soon. So thank you very much again for this opportunity and my greetings to all of you. I think, thank you Raja. I think we'll have some questions, if any, from the uh, our uh, panelists as well as from the delegates who are attending the meeting. Before that, may I ask Raja, you know, as you rightly said, uh, there are believers and non-believers and only time will tell what you're saying. I'm uh, not, not very believer. trying to, sorry? You're a non-believer. At the moment, I'm a non-believer. Uh, I have, because I understand that, yes, in the cervical spine and in the lumbar spine, there is more degeneration. So, yes, there is a chance that because of the mechanical problems that you have mentioned, the bacteria can go there and multiply. How about an isolated thoracic disc? Right? We see a young disc coming out, right? sorry, a virgin disc coming out and then causing pressure. So, there is not much mechanical instability there. There's not much tear there, but then still it comes out. And the same thing happens in sometimes we see in children. Children, I mean, children in the age group between 13 to 15 or 16 sometimes coming to us with big discs, though rare, they come. And we don't see much degeneration of the end plates there, but we see a, a nice, uh, you know, soft disc coming out. So does your theory, theory apply in those situations as well? Yeah, Rahul, uh, first of all, thank you very much for this question. Now, if we stay that uh, subclinical infection is the only cause for disc degeneration, that would be very, very wrong. Now, certainly there is a huge mechanical element to disc degeneration, but also mechanical degeneration, mechanical effect also cannot explain everything. For example, you see a degeneration at L4-5 and L2-3, and you get a L3-4 disc, which is absolutely normal. You get various patterns of uh, degeneration with completely normal discs and de discs which are completely degenerated. Which gene would affect only one disc in the body? Or what is the mechanical effect that would affect L2-3, but not L3-4? So it's a very big uh, interrelated issue. And as I told you in one of the slides, so now we think that it is all very, very interrelated. Now, we are now able to identify many of these bacteria also as coming from the gut. So what we feel is that there are small end plate breaks and also anural ruptures, and that is mechanically originated. Now, once this happens, neovascularization takes place, which takes the bacteria inside. And these bacteria are not Staphylococcus or uh, Pseudomonas or Klebsiella. They are fastidious organisms which cannot be cultured. They can be only identified by next genome sequencing. And they actually are very, very slow growing organisms and they produce enzymes which can disrupt the collagen, make the disc slightly weaker, which again makes it more susceptible for mechanical uh, effects. So it is not just subclinical infection. It's a combination of what's happening between the mechanics. And also we are saying that subclinical infection can be one of the causes. What we would like to emphasize from our research is a move away from the much believed thought process that in health, the human discs are completely sterile. It is not, it is just full of bacteria but those bacteria are completely different from the ones in which we see in the disc degeneration. This is called dysbiosis. And dysbiosis has been proved to be a problem in atherosclerosis, in irritable bowel syndrome. And subclinical infection has been proved in many, many diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or uh, even Parkinsonism now and many of the neurodegenerative disorders. So slowly, one by one, many of these diseases are going to be proved 
uh, at least to have an effect of bacterial infection. So we are not saying bacterial infection is the end of it all or the beginning of it all, but there is an element in which the subclinical infection produces inflammaging and this inflammaging weakens the matrix of the disc. Now, if I can take it further, this question, now how much the number of discs that you operate or you see in the clinical practice, how much, how many of these disc degenerations or bulges or sequestrations are due to infection? Just to put a, you know, a percentage and uh, how many are due to degeneration and other genetic issues in your-, in your all, of them, all of them are degenerated right. and all of them have bacteria. None of them will grow a bacteria if you culture because the organisms you are talking about are not culturable. So if you send, if you tell me, okay, Raja, I sent 10 of my uh, herniated samples and none of them grew any bacteria, I'm sure you're right because they are not culturable. That is the most important problem. These bacteria are completely different from the bacteria which we know as pathogens. And they can be only identified by next genome sequencing. For example, Raghav, we have 1 trillion human cells, but we have 13 trillion bacteria in the body. 65% of these bacteria have still not been coded. So our genome is overridden by the bacterial genome. And many, many diseases are now being uh, associated with this. So let me make it very clear. I'm not saying that bacterial infection is the only cause. I'm just saying that we need to keep sure, have the knowledge that human discs are loaded with bacteria in health and also in disease. And there is a dysbiosis between them. And we have been able to prove by a human defense reaction proteins that there is a mild element of infection, infective process and the host response going on. So we are not just saying that is it. We are saying, let's think of this possibility also. Raja, there is a question from a delegate. Similar to the pathogenesis of gastric ulcers and H. pylori, did you find a single organism that was implicated and can be targeted with antibiotic therapy? That's a question. Yeah. So P. agnes is the one that is being highly implicated. P. agnes, I mean, there are loads of papers which have identified P. agnes in the disc and people are very strong about it. But uh, in our study, we also found P. agnes. But in addition to P. agnes, we have found other bacteria also. Now that is the next question to find out. Is it just one of these bacteria or any of these bacteria can just start a small infect or inflammating trigger? Now it is not infecting the whole disc. It is just that these bacteria can trigger off an inflammation. And then the inflammation cascade starts. And once this cascade starts, then there are numerous biological pathways which can lead to degeneration. I mean, it's a long story, so I'm just putting it in short, but this is one of the interesting things that is coming up. There is a mounting evidence for this, but as you said, you know, I mean, when you first think about it, it looks impossible and it's very difficult to believe. Uh, yeah, Dr. Raga, we need to move forward, but allow me to ask one quest quick question to Dr. Frank. Uh, the certification that you gave, uh, so I believe it is uh, approved by the regulatory authorities in Germany. Uh, in fact, not really. That's currently exactly the thing which we are working on. So the problem is that we do not have a spine surgeon in Germany at the moment. We have either neurosurgeons or auto and trauma surgeons, we, which do spine surgery, but we do not have an official spine surgeon. And we are currently working on that topic. So do you have an official spine surgeon in India? Yeah, we have a national board of examinations, which runs a fellowship program, two-year fellowship program. It's not by the National Medical, uh, it's now combined under the National Me Medical Commission now. But uh, we have uh, around eight centers which are running fellowship programs. But uh, we, ASSI also has its own fellowship. So I was only exploring joint fellowship programs or joint certification or something like that. If we can explore on that, maybe we could carry that forward or further. Would be very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. We will uh, move on to the next uh, speaker. I'm sorry, my pronunciation of German names is not very good, but Professor Lindquist, if I'm right, on indication techniques and limitations of end block resection of primary bone tumors of the thoracic spine. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to uh, present uh, my experience and um, uh, the indications, limitation of on-block resection on the thoracic spine and primary malignant tumors. Um, the indications for on-block resection uh, are locally aggressive tumors like the giant cell tumor, the aggressive osteoblastoma, and mono and oligometastasized patients with breast, kidney, or thyroid cancer, and of course, the primary malignant tumors like sarcoma and chordoma. However, these are very rare uh, pathologies. The rationale behind that is that we know that um, uh, we have increased survival rates if we do an extra lesion resection sarcoma, and we have a reduced local recurrence rate in aggressive osteoblastoma, giant cell tumors, or solitary late metastases. The principle of on-block spondylectomy is an on-block resection with anicking appropriate margins, which means an extra lesion resection, and the tumor should be covered by a layer of healthy tissue, which means you have to uh, achieve free margins. And the way to do that is that you have to create a tumor-free corridor to release a drill sac with its content. And in most cases, you will find a, a, a tumor-free corridor like here, where you can, which you can resect and then deliberate the drill sac and do an on-block resection of the whole vertebral body. Just a few examples are here. Even if both pedicles are affected, you can uh, stay outside the tumor and do an excellent resection and create this corridor to release the dural sac. Here, a bit more challenging case, a giant cell tumor, where I do a, a lateral corridor here to release the dural sac. And here are the pathological specimen. And also here, we were able to achieve clear margins. Even in tough cases like this, with a malignant fibrous histiocytoma and a large uh, epidural involvement, as you can see here, and a large extra component, you will have a tumor-free corridor here. So even in this challenging case, we were able to perform an extra lesion resection. Uh, here you see a, a three-level on block resection with a reconstruction. Als Reconstruction bezeichnet man in den Um if you have, um, uh, uh, or in rare cases where both pedicles are affected, like here in this um, low-grade osteosarcoma, um, it's probably the best thing you can do is to do a contaminated marginal resection, as you did, as we did here, with a minimum spill of tumor cells um, with a front and back reconstruction, uh, as you can see on the X-ray. The technique I would like to um, ex explain to you is um, is the um, the um, front and back uh, reconstruction. We presented that back 2008 in the European Spine Journal. And ever since the technique hasn't changed very much. Um, and I would like to take you through a history of, of a case. It's a seven year old girl named Dania with history of leukemia and radiation therapy and bone marrow transplantation. And she received a total on block spondylectomy T4 to T7. Uh, further challenging comorbidities was a steroid-induced osteoporosis, and she was biopsied, and the histology showed a secondary osteosarcoma T4 to T7. And these are the, 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 the X-rays and MRI. You can see the osteolysis. She had a quite wide scarring of the biopsy, and <clears throat> you see a lesion of T3, and you see the affection T4 and T5, the solid tumor, and T6 and the affection uh, of the neuroframe in T6, T7. Uh, so this is the, the, the planning, and I just recommend do a very thorough surgical planning preoperatively. And I like to do this drawing and take it into the OR, put it on the wall, just to make sure uh, we're doing the right thing. And this is a total on block spelling, T4 to T7, and this is the, the planned resected specimen. What we do is we leave the biopsy scar and then contaminate biopsy cord on the specimen. We put on pedicle screws, T2, T3, T8, and 9. We do wide lateral rib osteotomies on the left, 
and proximal rib osteopenies on the right. We create a tumor-free corridor and release the nerve roots and do a simpler release on the right because that's going to be the side we will face downwards when we put the patient on the right. Uh, we do uh, left-sided nerve root ligation because here the tumor is uh, too large of extent. We do subtotal disc incision, T3, 4, and T7, and 8, and transect completely the posterior anus, which is very important because from the front, it's hard to get that approach. We do phlebotomy and bilateral laminotomy, T3, to resect the spinous process, T3, as well, and then a temporary rod. Then we have a short break and do a right lateral position. We drape the posterior wound as well, do high thoracotomy on the left side, complete the discectomies, and then we open the posterior wound and do a simultaneous uh, a, a rotation of, of that spasm, uh, spondectomy of the four vertebral bodies. And you can see here um, still the, the skin scar and the corridor of the biopsy corridor still on the resected spasm. And by that, we, we stay outside the tumor and have a strictly x ray resection. And here you see the vertebral body, T4, 5, 6, and 7, with a large uh, tumor mass here. And a Gore-Tex uh, patch reconstruction of the chest wall is important as well. Here the post of x-rays, that was an eight hour surgery with three and a half milliliter of blood loss. And I have, yes, the six years follow up uh, so far, no evidence of, of disease. Um, so commonly uh, thoracic on block spondectomies are rarely single level resection, but in most cases, multi-level resection. So uh, a nerve root sacrifice is frequently necessary. We know from studies from the PAN that up to three pairs are neurologically safe. If you have to do more than that, you might end up in ischemic paraplegia. Here's just a couple of examples of osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma with multi-level resection. What about the fusion length? Uh, normally, uh, if you have two or three level resection, two above and two below is, uh, is sufficient. If you have more than three level to resect, as you see on the right side, it's probably safe to, to um, instrument three levels above and three levels below. And don't forget the additional entry of fixation to get maximum stability. Um, as pointed out, excise the scar and the, the biopsy tract, if possible, like here in the 12-year-old girl with the osteosarcoma with a huge laminectomy defect, where we left the skin scar and the corridor on the specimen to get free margins. And we have an eight-year post-op complete remission follow-up of this lady. Um, if you want to start with this technique, well, the easy ones are the one level with hardly any soft tissue involvement, with a wide tumor-free corridor, no pre-op surgery at the virgin spine, with a small biopsy tract and thoracolumbar region is probably the easiest one. Lower lumbar and higher thoracic are the most challenging one. And of course, the psychological burden on the surgical skills uh, are, are somewhat less than the metastasis compared to primary tumors like sarcoma. The tough ones are the multi-level resection, a large soft tissue involvement, rib involvement, like here in the four level or in another case, a six level resection, osteosarcoma uh, with wide bilateral rib osteotomies and nerve root sacrifice. And this patient ended up in a, an ischemic paraplegia. However, she's still alive. She had 12 year post-op follow-up on her and she's still alive with no evidence of disease. Um, extensive rib involvement, like in this urine sarcoma, might be challenging. And here it's very important to cover the chest wall with a Gore-Tex patch. And here's the girl uh, and the post of X-rays after on block resection of two level plus uh, three ribs. If you have the if you have the rare instance of a single level affection uh, with hardly any soft tissue map, you might go for a posterior only on block resection. However, you do not have any anterior control and certainly high mortality. So my choice of preference is certainly the combined posture and anterior technique. Complication you might end up is of course bleeding, uh, uh, dural tears if you have one close it very meticulously, neural deficits, infection or even local recurrence as pointed out in these cases. Um, this is an interesting, this was an interesting uh, uh, complication. The more you the more cases you do, the more 
uh, long-term complications you will experience. And this was seven years post-resection of an angiosarcoma. And she had a broken rod, as you can see here, uh, with a kyphos uh, and a pseudarthrosis. So we repaired that and the surgeon who did it thought, well, I, I do some correction of the kyphos, but she woke up paraplegic. And you can see here why, because the, the posterior rib that we had put on as a biological graft fractured and impinged into the spinal canal. So we took it immediately back to, to theater and decompressed the spinal canal, did this four rod reconstruction. Fortunately, she recovered completely. Tips and tricks. Uh, this is a uh, high level surgery. Uh, you need, first of all, a clear strategy. You need a good radiologist to go through all your x-rays, MRIs and CT scans to know where is tumor? Where do I have a tumor-free corridor? You have to have a profound experience in entry approaches, microsurgery, vascular surgery. And you should be creative when you reconstruct your spine. Like here, we do posterior uh, biological reconstruction with iliac crest grafts or here with fibrillographs just to enable a long-term stability in young patients. Um, you need an experienced anesthesia team and stand by, I always include my, or inform my vascular surgeon. In many cases, I don't need them, but it's a good feeling to have them informed that in case you need them, they are prepared. And again, especially if you have primary tumors like sarcomas, free margins are the primary goal and the prerequisite for survival. Thank you very much for your attention and best greetings from Germany. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the panelists? Okay, I have a question, uh, which is uh, one of the problems that we face is in these osteoclastomas and when they recur, it's a big problem. So how do you deal with recurrent osteoclastomas? Well, the best thing is of course to prevent them by doing it right in the first time. So we resect osteoclastomas, giant cell tumors, uh, extra lesion if possible. And if you have recurrences, you might uh, talk to the radiologist or to the oncologist with some adjuvant therapy to, to decrease the tough soft tissue involvement uh, and then go for death for surgery after this adjuvant therapy to, to uh, make life a bit easier. But I think that the most decisive thing is to do it right from the beginning. And we know that we have a 50% recurrence rate if we do it intralesionally. So try to resect them extra lesion with free margins from from the beginning. Do you use radiation if there is a recurrence, re recurrence after uh, recurrence, after you do this uh, excision and not, as well as radiation? Not routinely, no, not routinely. Radiation doesn't play a major role, no. Right. Would you use gamma knife or proton beam ther therapy? In no. a giant cell tumor, no. Recurrent ones? Even in recurrent ones, no. It's, no. a, it's a surgical therapy. Okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, there are no further questions. Agar, uh, yeah. Agar, can I ask a question, please? Sure, sure. Arvind. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lenkwitz, great, great presentation, great work. Uh, I have a basic uh, surgical question to you. Uh, you, you you're, from your x-rays and your presentation, I could see that you you use um, a fibula or a rib to cover the large uh, laminar defect at the back before closure, right? Number one, if, you, if you're using these bone grafts, uh, you, you, do you, uh, how do you keep that into position, number one? Uh, what, are, what is your, uh, your take on using uh, titanium mesh uh, opened out, like a titanium mesh, and putting broom draft over that? Very good question. Thank you very much. What we do is in, in the lumbar spine, especially in the, it, you have to differentiate. In, in metastasis patient, you probably do not influence the, the long-term survivalship. So here, I probably do not pay that much attention to posterior biological reconstruction. But in all, in all the kids and younger patients with the primary sarcomas, I do try to reconstruct the posterior uh, uh, column as well. And what we do is in one level on block spondylectomies in the lumbar spine that I take a, a butterfly, butterfly graft from the iliac crest. And I just uh, squeeze it in between the remaining spinous processes of the neighboring vertebra and fix it with a transverse connector, number one, and then cover it with bone. If you have larger defects, the titanium mesh is a wonderful idea. You just cover your, your spinal canal and then you put on bone graft, allogenic or bone graft on that. Or what we do in, in longer 
in, in two or three level on block spondylectomies, I like to take autologous uh, 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 fibular grafts. And what we do is, that was your question, I think, we secure them with, with titanium screws to the upper two and lower two spinous processes. Thank you. Lovely. There are a couple of questions here. Uh, one is, I think it's uh, not correct, but how do you deal with circumferential cardoma, number one? And number two is arm block resection possible in cervical spine? Yes. Well, uh, in, in circumferential cardoma, that's, um, these are challenging ones. And here we do, uh, of course, all of these cases are, are discussed in the tumor board. And here, proton beam radiation and, and the, the, the ther radiotherapists do play a major role. So I think also from the literature, what, what is now recommendable is to, to do a, a tumor size reduction and then go for radiotherapy. And in the cervical spine, you always have the problem of the vertebral artery. So what you definitely need to do is to check what is your main and dominant vertebral artery. If you have a non-dominant vertebral artery, you might resect it and occlude it preoperatively with the help of the radiologist. But of course, cervical spine, especially the upper cervical spine is even uh, uh, a very, very tricky anatomic region. <laughs> Let's Love. put it this way. All right, I think uh, we're running late and I've uh, been getting warnings from the organizers. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Raghav, Dr. Raghav, Dr. Raghav, Dr. Yeah. Raghav sorry, Dr. Venkatesh here. Yeah. Uh, regarding the on box cycle spine resection, uh, I think we should watch uh, Dr. Boriana's interview today at evening. Right. So he is going to talk about it. Sure, lovely. The interview, yeah. Thanks. Let's move on to the next speaker, Peter Vakoxi. Sorry, once again, treatment strategies for thoracic disc herniations. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation to this joint symposium between the German Spine Society and your distinguished society. And it's a pleasure to detail you our key concepts for the surgical management of thoracic disc herniations, which is still a challenge despite all the advances that we have seen in the surgical treatment of degenerative spine disease. So why is it so difficult sometimes to treat these um, thoracic disc herniations? Number one, it's, these are quite rare and this is why we are not really um, prepared and trained well because less than 1% of all disc herniations are in the thoracic level. Number two, there is really no room for conservative treatment since most of the patients will present with severe neurological symptoms asking for a surgical treatment. Most of these lesions are localized in the mid-thoracic area and they are localized centrally and sometimes intradural, which makes it challenging to remove them without injuring the um, spinal cord. And most of these are hard and they are calcified, which again makes it difficult to fish them out of the spinal canal. The diagnostic workup, that's how it starts, is uh, straightforward. Number one, we start with the MR. Most of these patients present with incomplete spinal cord symptoms. And then we, when, we, when we have identified the, the disc herniation, we have to clarify whether it's soft or whether it's calcified. And this is usually done with a CT imaging, as in this case, where we can identify the, the centrally localized calcified disc herniation. The laminectomy, the pure laminectomy, has been the standard approach for most of these lesions for a long time. Today we have learned that this is a high-risk surgical procedure which is meanwhile obsolete for thoracic disc herniations because the complication rate is high and even there is a certain risk for mortality of these patients due to a, due to a severe a spinal cord injury. It's obvious that just removing the dorsal lamina will not adequately decompress the spinal canal in the kyphotic thoracic spine where the disc herniations will push the spinal cord back. And this is why in the past several procedures have been suggested for the surgical treatment and for the surgical removal of thoracic discs where either the, the paddicle, the facet joint, the, the rib head or um, parts of the rib are removed or we are coming in through, uh, through a thoracotomy to come more laterally and advancing more laterally to the, to the spinal cord and to the spinal column. But basically it's very simple. If the thoracic disc is localized medially and is hard, then one should come from a posterolateral lateral or from a lateral approach. If it's soft or localized more laterally, then 
um, a posterior approach might be um, sufficient if, par if parts of the facet joints or the, the pedicle are removed. Here our favorite approach, and this is what I would like to detail first, is the uh, mini-open transthoracic approach where we will um, where we'll advance to the spine through a retropleural preparation. The patient is, um, look, uh, is, is positioned in a lateral position. We will expose, expose the rib over the um, index level. The rib will be removed over a length of approximately 5 centimeters. Then we will perform a blunt dissection retropleurally and we will identify the, uh, the, the disc and we will retract the, the lung. And this can be all done by microscopic means and for sure, maybe endoscopic means are not necessary. Everything can be done microscopically. And the concept is then to drill a, a cavity into the bone, into the disc space, which will then allow to push the calcified fragment away from the spinal cord into this cavity and thereby directly decompress the spinal canal and the spinal cord from this calcified disc. Besides the microscopic approach, the the, uh, the, uh, this approach has been also um, benefited from navigation and intraoperative imaging. Here we have a case where we, that we have performed a full navigated approach. We have identified the level, we have planned the extent of resection, and we have performed intraoperative imaging in order to confirm the extent of bony resection and the, the, uh, the removal of the calcified discs. So navigation and intraoperative CT are really helpful uh, tools in order to further improve on the quality of uh, the surgical removal of these thoracic discs through a transthoracic trans approach. And in our last cases, we have a further advanced to the minimally, minimally invasive approach using these tubes, which are inserted through the mini thoracotomy. They are placed at the level of at the index level, and today we are removing discs through these tubes, which again minimizes the trauma or the minimizes the access to these discs. This is a video detailing the classical microscopic approach, the transthoracic approach to this calcified um, thoracic disc. Here is the mini opening, uh, the small skin incision, the exposure of the rib, which is removed for a length of 5 centimeters. Then we have the blunt dissection. Retropleurally, the lung is slowly mobilized and here we are at the bottom of the preparation, the lateral aspect of the spine. We can identify the disc and we are slowly removing the soft tissue or mobilizing the soft tissue. Here the segmental vessel is coagulated and controlled and then, and then cut. We identify the, the rib head which will be removed partially in order to identify the lateral aspect of the pedicle in order to gain access to the spinal cord. This is again um, identifying the correct level either by fluoro or by navigation. Here we are using the high speed drill and now we are removing parts of the disc in the center. We are um, removing the, the ligament over the disc and then we will use the high-speed drill in order to create that cavity approximately 5 mm into the upper um, end plate and 5 mm into the lower end plate. And this cavity will then allow to push the fragments into this cavity away from the spinal cord. We are using the, the drill with a continuous irrigation and by getting more Towards the spinal cord, we can then identify the posterior ligament, which is usually calcified. Sometimes it's very, it's very attached to the, um, to the disc fragment. And here you can identify the dura. And then with the help of the assistant and with the help of microsurgical sharp dissection techniques, the calcified posterior ligament plus the calcified disc are pulled away from the dura uh, instead of um, mobilizing the disc directly to us. So first pushing the fragments into, the, um, into this cavity will allow to slowly decompress um, the spinal canal and you can see the, 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 the stepwise decompression of the dura. And then we are using the intraoperative CT in order to confirm the extent of our drilling and to confirm the removal of the calcified disc. 
In addition to this trans-thoracic approach, I would like to introduce you to an additional alternative, which has been recently described by the Dutch group around um, Dr. Coppes. The, the route they are taking is again a posterior approach, but instead of going around the dura, the dura is open in, opened in the posterior level, then the dentate ligament is cut, the dura can then be rotated uh, using um, sutures which are tacked to the, posterior, to the dural ligament and then this allows us to open the anterior dura again and then with you having a transdural approach to the disc you are then able to slowly remove soft discs and even hard discs. This has been initially reported with 13 patients, meanwhile the group has an experience with 30 patients. The results are very good and the complication rates are low. We have tried these with our last um, uh, cases. This is a case of a soft central um, localized um, disc. Here we have already opened the posterior dura. Here is the dentate ligament which has been cut. The spinal cord is rotated. You can see the tack-up suture. And here the anterior dura has been opened, incised sharply, and the soft disc is slowly removed. And you can appreciate the minimally invasive access to this um, delicate area and by, um, by mobilizing the dentate ligament, the spinal cord can be now manipulated in a way um, that the disc can be removed. It comes without saying that all these manipulations are done under neurophysiological monitoring with the continuous assessment of MEPs and SEPs, but with a hook and with um, the, the micro dissectors these um, soft discs and sometimes even the hard discs can be removed by this posterior transdural approach. The dura is then simply sutured with 6-0 sutures or it can be patched or glued. Especially the anterior dura um, will then be compressed and uh, the posterior dural is classically um, sutured. So we have two approaches which are very helpful in treating thoracic disc herniations today. The neurological outcome in the literature has been reported to be excellent. In comparison to the data that we have from the laminectomy, we see excellent results, especially with the trans, trans thoracic approach, but also the posterolateral and the lateral approaches seem to be very efficient and um, more successful than the laminectomy alone. Here you can see the predictors of an unfavorable outcome and especially the preoperative motor deficits and those patients that had previous surgeries, these patients seem to be high-risk candidates despite everything that we can do uh, with modern surgical techniques. Here another study sh uh, detailing the postoperative complications and nicely showing that in comparison to laminectomy, the posterolateral and the lateral approaches are characterized by very few complications, neurological complications, and the same is um, true for the surgical approach complications, where all these, are compli where all these approaches are characterized by a low incidence of surgical or approach-associated complications. So in conclusion, this is our current working algorithm for the surgical management of um, thoracic disc herniations. We start with an MR and with a CT. Those uh, thoracic disc herniations that are soft and that are lateral are good candidates for posterior lateral approaches where we remove the pedicle, remove the, hit, the, the, um, the rib hat or even parts of the proximal rib. Then these soft and lateral discs can be removed safely. If, however, the disc is localized more centrally or if it is hard or calcified on the CT, then we, would, then we will consider a posterior transdural approach if they are more on the lateral side, which I've shown you. And if they are really centered in the, in the midline, lo set, lo localized centrally, and if they are hard and calcified, and if they are of big size, then we would recommend rather come in from a transthoracic approach if they are extradural. And if we can identify them to be intradural, we would come in with a posterior transdural approach. And I hope and I'm convinced that this kind of algorithm might be of use in the future for treating um, thoracic discs in, in, in your practice. Thank you very much for your attention. Doc, there's just uh, one question here. 
Now, don't you think that fixation and fusion at the index level is important because the procedure creates a big cavity in the adjacent bodies? This is our, from our Professor Sudhir Srivastava. I Did think you that's an important question? question and um, everybody, and this has to be considered on a very individual basis. If you look at the literature about the long follow-up of these I mean, this is not a big cavity. It's a, it's a minimized um, oblique drilling that you do from coming in from the trans thoracic approach. So all the literature sa says that you might not need a fusion and until the posterior elements are intact because the patient has not had previous surgery, um, our experience is that you will get away. But obviously, you have to assess the amount of drilling intraoperatively or postoperatively. And if you feel that you have destabilized the spine because you have removed too much bone, then a second staged um, surgery with a posterior lateral fusion makes sense. And I would rather recommend to do one more than do, to do one few or not, not enough. But the data is not really supporting the need in general for, for fusion. Okay, a couple of quick questions. Uh, how do you deal with CSF leak in trans uh, 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 thoracic approach? that is transpural. How do you deal with CSF leak in a transthoracic approach that is transplural? That's the perfect question for the upcoming case illustration that I'm going to show you. Because in the case that I will describe in a few minutes, we really created a leak due to a very calcified large um, disc fragment. And we tried to patch this coming in from, through the transthoracic approach and it didn't really work. So the lesson that we have learned, just to tell you in advance from this case is that it's really helpful to come in early through a posterior approach and repair the leak um, transdurally. So this is really a good question. And I think trying to fix it through a transthoracic approach is often not successful. Thank you, Peter. I think we should stop there because there are lots of questions coming up, but I'm sure uh... Will uh, you will address them at a later time? Uh, we will move on to Bharat Dave. Panel uh, faculty to uh, look at the chat box, Dr. Peter, Dr. Uh, Marcus, Dr. Frank, and Dr. Ulf, because there are a lot of questions for you on the chat box. If yes. you look at that, you can answer them. Yeah. Now we will move on to the next topic surgical approaches to thoracic myelopathy by Bharat Dave. Greetings from Bharat Dave. I'm talking on behalf of Dr. Ajay Shetty, who is not able to attend the meeting today. Um, my topic is dorsal myelopathy, surgical approaches. Dorsal myelopathy can be seen in various conditions. As this case, one can see the ligamentum flavum calcification. We call this as OLF, ossification of ligamentum flavum. Could be because of the prolapsed disc commonly seen in the lower dorsal area could be because of the infection which is quite common seen in our part of the world that is because of the tuberculosis could be because of the metastasis secondaries or even primary tumors as well and could be because of the fracture spine the dorsal myelopathy but the most important thing is the clinical radiological correlation and that has to be achieved by proper assessment before planning the surgery. And for that, most important is we have to ask about the bladder valve involvement and have to have the grading of the neurology. X-ray are must because these are the junctional problems and where we really need to count the vertebral level. And that is why DL and LS junction has to be included in the X-ray. And most of the time, in order to rule out the tandem stenosis, we usually have the full length MRI and CT scan is an added tool in order to see the calcification. Eventually, we confirm the diagnosis and have the clinical radiological correlation and treat this pathology. Also, we should be assessing the outcome, neuro deficit, how much it's going to improve and we have to stress about the post-op rehabilitation. And the most important will be the social support. If the poor social support, then the overall outcome is really bad so management strategies well it's a surgical disease myelopathy particularly the dorsal spine it's a surgical disease can we treat with the solubitrol well most of the time we do see 
patients being treated with steroids but it does give temporary relief but at the end the compression has to be relieved coming to the case discussion 65 year male who had back pain since 10 years but there was recent worsening of the activity of daily living and had upper motor neuron lesion with hyperreflexia and planters upgoing but bladder bowel were normal but his cardiac function was only 30% injection fraction this were his mri one can see the lesion in the lower dorsal compression as well as the disc prolapse as well you can see that symptomatic level was operated because the cardiac function was only 30% Although patient had lumbar stenosis, which was predominantly not symptomatic as patient had a recent onset of the symptom and activity of daily living. This 10 years of the back pain which he had in the history was because of the lumbar degeneration. Another case, 49 year old lady, both thigh pain, 2 years, tingling numbness, both lower limb. She was non-walker, 1.5 year and spasticity in both the lower limb. Her neurology was power grade 3 by 5 with hyperreflexia and planters of going. X-ray reveals uh, density of the bone that has increased and one can see calcification of ligamentum flavum which is predominantly compressing the posterior cord. He was operated by end block removal of the lamina at the compression level. One can see adequate decompression in the MRI. Usually we have the post-operative MRI done at our center. This patient had adherent dura with the ligament of flavum and there was adequate decompression seen. Another case, 45 year female, spastic paraparesis in 6 months. It was nearing grade 4 and bladder bubble had been affected. One can see the tandem stenosis in the dorsal and lumbar spine. But she was young, 45 and she also had surgery done for the dorsal and the lumbar spine and one can see the post-operative MRI and X-ray done and adequate decompression seen. The key point here for these surgeries are laminectomy, bone scalpel, dural injury can happen because of the flavum adherent to the dura. Particularly we see in our cases in our part of the world fluorosis is quite common. And we always go for the post-op MRI in order to make sure that we have done the adequate decompression. Another case presentation, 21 year male, had both lower limb weakness, tingling numbness since 4 months and he was able to walk with the 2% support due to power grade 2-3 in both the lower limb and spastic gait. One can see Again, the decrease in the disc space at D10, D11, D11, D12 as well. These are the X-rays, reveals bone density increased as well. One can see the dorsal disc prolapse at D10, D11, more on the right side. This patient had lateral extra cavitatory approach. We often sacrifice the nerve root in order to have the proper access without um, retracting the dural sac. We are able to remove the disc and we have fixed that because we usually remove the parse and we put the cage, we push the fragment into the disc space so that there is no manipulation of the cord. And this is confirmed by the MRI post-operative. One can see and the CT scan as well, one can see very well decompressed uh, dural sac. Similar case in 2011, patient had symptoms, acute onset 2 months, both lower limb tingling numbness, significant imbalance and bladder bubble, they were normal. His range of movements, they were free and he had upper motor neural lesion with clonus on the left side. He also had D10, D11 dorsal disc, these appeared to be the soft disc. And this patient had immediate post-operative when we reviewed he had neurological worsening. So we had sent this patient for MRI and one can see that immediate post-op we had missed the level uh, of this patient and there was worsening due to the same. So we ended up operating him again on the second day and this was redo surgery done at the lower level. So the key point 
patient can be operated dorsal disc probably may be endoscopically transthoracic but our approach is uh, through the uh, parts removal and do the discectomy and put the screws collapsed disc has to be identified whenever there is post op worsening consider that one may have missed the level we never distract when we do this type of disc surgery when there is anterior compression the neurological deficit is likely and we operate all these cases in the neuro monitoring so the management strategy for dorsal stenosis is only laminectomy is contraindicated in anterior compression whenever there is kyphosis only laminectomy is indicated when there is posterior stenosis due to ligamentum tibum compression or ossification anterior decompression through posterior approach can be achieved through the lika approach and we have had one publication in global spine mentioning the same with successful outcome in 18 patients only one patient had neurological worsening which i shown earlier posterior laminectomy is really helpful with the scalpel bone scalpel is one of the tool which has changed our practice because we have pleurotic patients and sometime we end up decompressing from c1 to l2 maybe up to l4 so the whole spine we are able to decompress with two team using two bone scalpel and two consoles tandem stenosis has to be ruled out whenever we operate these cases in order not to miss the level either cranial or caudal thank you for your patience here thank you thank you bharat uh, i am sure uh... most of us uh, yeah, any questions from the audience here none as uh, we are getting late i think we will go on to the next topic and if there are any questions uh, coming up on the chat box kindly have a look and we can discuss later if you have time we will move on to the next topic indications techniques tips and tricks for thoracoscopic spine surgery in trauma cases by marcus aran Oh, um, folks, can you hear me already? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Okay, perfect. So, I just have to get my screen done. One second. Okay, can you uh, can you realize my um, screen? Yes, yes, we can. We can. Looks perfect. 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 Thank you. Now the technique goes back uh, on a former president of the German uh, uh, Reiches uh, German Spine Society in 1994, Daniel Rosenthal. He described first um, the techniques of thoracoscopic spine surgery in uh, herniated discs, and um, this is actually I uh, searched for my first uh, operating. Um, um, report uh, when i did it first it's about 3 uh, 23 years ago and in 1995 uh, the first reports came uh, using that technique in trauma um now i have a problem in uh, getting now okay um the capability of a new technique using it is always a question do i achieve the same uh, tasks uh, with the new technique uh, than with older ones and the others how is uh, the problem um, with um, uh, complications uh, with the new technique um in this uh, matter the conversation situation so whenever i start a thoracoscopic procedure um when i end up uh, with the open procedure and you can see um uh, uh, the the situation in uh, my field um i'm overlooking about 300 thoracoscopic procedures and in the first 10 years I had uh, six converse, uh, conversions of uh, um, thoracoscopic operations in open operations, and in the last 13 years, I only had one converse, uh, conversion. Now, before you can do an anterior thoracoscopic procedure, at first you have to have a posterior reduction 
and a posterior pre-stabilized uh, spine. So as an um, standing alone anterior procedure, the thoracoscopic spine uh, stabilization is not a good instrument. And as well, you need a controlled situation. We often have polytraumatized patients. We have uh, uh, pulmonary injured uh, situations. And these patients, they must be preoperative with an intact pulmonary function. Now, the indication for anterior procedures is at one part, the um, uh, situation you can see here that this is a post-operative CT scan of a TH12 fracture. And this is the same patients four months later with the next CT scan. You can see um, the, um, the intruded vertebral body. You can see the loss of correction of the vertebral body. You can um, see uh, the vacuum phenomenon uh, this is a situation you would be not able to heal it adequately. Another indication for the anterior procedure is um, defects in the vertebral body and uh, corporal kyphosis, and as well as I will present you a case, um, encroachment of the spinal canal. Now, pro thoracoscopy is you have a very, very good exposition Everybody can see the same what you are doing. The visibility is perfect. Brightness resolution is perfect. There are contraindications. What I told you, pulmonary insufficiency. Then sometimes anatomic variation. Today, that wouldn't be a big problem because I very, I verify from uh, different approaches, uh, right to left as well. So if you have a problem with the aorta or the position of the aorta, you have to go, to go uh, from the right, that is no problem. The multi-level instrumentation would also be not a case I wouldn't do today. So it's a learning curve. And what I told you before, this is a prerequisitation that you need a reduction, you are not um, able to reduce intraoperatively. Now, this is the positioning of the patient, lateral position. I usually prefer to stand in the back of the patient. The um, uh, fluoroscope, this is, uh, I personally like the fluoroscope from the belly of the patient coming. There's one assistant there, and there is the camera assistant with me on the side, on the back side of the patient. And if I'm doing a upper thoracic spine, the camera assistant is uh, 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 positioned uh, with the legs. And if I do a lower thoracic spine, L1 uh, up to L3, uh, L2, sorry, then the camera assistant is uh, towards the head. Now, this is the positioning. You uh, you open the situation, the rib cage to uh, the approach. And what is mandatory at first, you have to uh, get really lateral positions with the imaging intensifier of the instrument uh, instrumentation uh, location. And you need to know exactly where the projection of the vertebral body you have to go on is on the skin. This is very, very mandatory. Otherwise, you will have problems. This is the approach for the camera. This is the approach for the retractor. Now, this is uh, such a case, a uh, uh, 21-year-old male motorcyclist, polytrauma, initial paraplegia. This is uh, the lesion, it's a TH6 rotation burst fracture. And I'm going to uh, show you the thoracoscopic views. This is the pre-stabilization by a posterior approach. And uh, now we go on uh, what you can see here. This is the vertebral uh, situation. Um, this is uh, the pleura, which we uh, try to get away. And it's very important, these two pins, this is one over the instrumentation, one lower 
in the instrumentation. Left is leg, right is uh, head. And here I'm, in, I'm doing the incision of the lower disc towards the leg. Um, and uh, you can always in the picture can see these two pins, which are um, placed under a uh, fluoroscopic uh, view. Um, because if you rotate, if you rotate the camera, you really get uh, immediately lost in the picture um, and you don't realize what's going on here. You see the lung and the retractor. And um, at first, uh, normal procedure removing of the disc, the spinal canal is about, is around there. Uh, now here, um, the disc is removed. Now you're taking the chisel and taking out the vertebral body. Um, I'm always trying to work forward, not backwards, because on the back sides, it's the spinal canal. Here, uh, uh, underneath um, the, um, uh, the retractor, it's the aorta. So you have to be a little bit uh, careful about that. And what you can see here is it is always possible. That's already uh, the, uh, uh, the posterior longitudinal ligament. You are doing the decompression. You have a perfect view. You can uh, move your camera. You have a 30 degree camera. You move, can move it as uh, you want. You take out um, the bone fragments with the spoon or with the, this, um, uh, um, this rangeur, as you can see that. And you try to get a, a perfect um, um, uh, place for your vertebral body replacement. Here you can see the, the, the place of uh, the uh, spinal canal. Now, the next step is uh, you just put in the uh, vertebral uh, body replacement. I prefer to use uh, expansion system. Uh, this is uh, very easy for thoracoscopic use. Um, here, the expansion. Um, here, actually, you see the dia diaphragma down there. Um, and uh, you have to be a little bit careful um, not to overextend the system. Um, you have to take, uh, using the placement, you have to take the, the fluoroscope. And now this is the scene after um, the operation. You should uh, take back the pleura um, to uh, close the whole situation. Here you see the lung then, the, uh, you see um, the heart region around here. And before you go back on the, uh, here already the pins are removed. Before you go back, you just put some water in. Here you see the thorax branch and you do um, um, peep lung um, ventilation. Um, and you really check if there is any lesion of the lung and then the operative procedure um, uh, is over. This is the intraoperative view. You can see again here, this is very important that you don't uh, get lost intraoperatively. You always, during the operation, you need um, uh, an indication what rotation you have during the operation. Here you can see uh, the decompression, which is complete in that case. Post-operative treatment, we usually do an immediate extubation. In earlier times, when you did the trans diaphragmal approach, we had at least three to five days uh, um, uh, post-operative um, um, uh, breath management. And um, we have an immediate uh, mobilization of the patient and we always do the post-operative um, CT. Now, in my view, it's a very, very advantageous uh, procedure. Um, it is a significant patient benefit. Uh, we have a reduced excess morbidity. Um, if you are really, um, you have a learning curve with this technique, but uh, if you have really uh, a good uh, technical behavior, it's um, a very safe um, um, uh, operative procedure. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
So are there any questions <clears throat> to Dr. Marcus uh, or, to, or to Dr. Bharat Dave? Dr. Chawla, can I ask a question to Dr. Yeah, Marcus? Yeah, sure, sir. Yeah, uh, two questions, Dr. Marcus. A great presentation and, and great handicraft there. Uh, uh, lovely visualization. Um, I noticed that your lungs were inflated. Normally in thoracoscopy, you have a single lung anesthesia. Do you, do you, uh, do you follow that? Or your lungs... Yeah. Uh, Looked uh, yes. inflated here. Yeah. Yes, you you, you need you definitely you need uh, one lung ventilation. This is very very important. Uh, so so you you need a double tube, and this must be placed perfect. And um, in the be beginning of the procedure, um, I had to convert one time because I didn't get not a good one lung ventilation. This. Um, makes the situation very important. Um, if you have one bad lung of a traumatized patient, the other side must be your approach side and must be good. Otherwise, the procedure doesn't work. The, the second question, if, if you have to uh, decompress two, uh, two uh, levels, D12, L1, would you, would, your approach would be transthoracic, then you, then you go retroperitoneal or you just cut the diaphragm and go down? Uh, still, um, my approach would be still transthoracic. You, uh, it is no problem to uh, get access uh, to the segment um, uh, L1, L2, but this is the lowest you can do. You can do an instrumentation on L2, transthoracic, uh, um, but you, you will not be able to do instrumentation on L3. So the last decompression you can do is um, L2, um, L1, L2. This is the last decompression. You cannot go, get lower, but I would say um, the transthoracic approach or, or the transthoracic approach, um, L1 is easier than the retroporetonal uh, approach, in my view. So, so, so when you go down to say L1 or, or even L2, if you said you can go down to L2, in which case do you, do you remove a portion of the diaphragm there? You can make a small, small opening? Yeah, you just, you just uh, uh, make a split, a small split, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, par parallel to the vertebral column, very easy. Um, the problem, as lower as you go, as longer is the distance to the vertebral body. This is, it's very easy uh, in uh, TH12, TH11, and it gets uh, more difficult as lower you go. So in that case, again, a technical question. In that case, and your, your thoracoscopy, uh, endoscopy, thoracoscopy, how do you repair the split in the diaphragm that you do? You, you take I, staples? I suture it. Uh, sutures. Uh, I, I suture it. Okay. Okay, I think we must uh, come to an end uh, of this session. We're coming to an end. Just uh, one last question here. Would using an expandable cage increase the incidence of pseudarthrosis in trauma? You're using expandable cages. Are you worried about pseudarthrosis, unlike in a tumor situation? Did you, you asked me, I think. Yes, so, yes. Um, I personally, I put bone, a lot, uh, the, the resected bone, um, of the of the fractured vertebral body, I put that in the cage and on the cage. And usually, uh, if you don't if you don't do an over distraction of the situation, I didn't really observe uh, the problem of pseudarthrosis. Um, it's also possible to use an a, 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 an additional plate uh, fixation or rod fixation with the transthoracoscopic um, uh, techniques to reduce the risk of uh, um, whatever pseudarthrosis. Okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, we are a few minutes late here. Now, is Dr. Chabra there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah on behalf of uh, Association of Spine Surgeons of India, thank you very much. Over to Gautam to take on, uh, go on to the next session.